Welcome, everyone. Um, I have Gerald here, who um, works at a literal gold mine over in Utah. Um, so Gerald is part of Liberty Gold, Pilot Gold. They have a couple million ounces of gold, and he's in some of the most robust GIS modeling that I've ever seen. So take it away. Thank you for joining us. All right. And um, as you know, this is my witness. I will get him all the presentation swag. It's all like next time I see him. He had COVID on Monday, and we're thank you for not coming in and making us sick. We appreciate that. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Okay, um, uh, thanks everybody. Um, I'm Gerald Heston. I'm the environmental and GIS manager for Liberty Gold. And we are a Toronto Stock Exchange listed gold exploration company and our headquarters are in Vancouver, BC. And uh, we operate out of our office in Elko, Nevada. And I'm actually based in Reno, Nevada. And our business is finding and responsibly developing gold deposits throughout the Western US. Um, our two flagship projects are Black Pine in Southern Idaho and the Gold Strike Project in Southern Utah. Uh, we have about 20 people uh, across North America, uh, mostly geologists as well as uh, myself, permitting uh, admin uh, management. It's a great, really great group of people to work for. Uh, we've been together, most of us have been together since 2011 or before. Uh, the Gold Strike Mine is a historic mine uh, about 35 miles northwest of St. George in Washington County. Um, it's a historic district. It's probably the Spanish were mining it uh, back in the 1890s. Uh, gold was reported there in the 1890s. There was some early underground mining in the 1910s, which was focusing on high grade ore zones. Um, there was a three stamp mill installed in 1910, which is still standing, and that's the photo on the right. Um, it was part of a much larger operation uh, coming out of the stream. A um, couple photos we have here, um, some nuggets that were taken out of the stream. Uh, that's one to two millimeters across there on the left. And there's also a specimen that's in the Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, the district was mostly idle until the 1970s uh, when the Carlin style mineralization was discovered. Uh, Starting the 1970s through the 1980s, um, there was quite a bit of exploration. And then Tenneco and USMX companies mined from a dozen small pits over a six kilometer long area, uh, produced 209,000 ounces of gold and 198,000 ounces of silver. And so we have some photos on the right here of what that looked like in the 1990s. Um, in 1994, mining ceased due to stagnant gold prices and lack of room for expansion. All the pads were rinsed and all the site facilities were removed and the site was reclaimed in the 1990s and now it is completely reclaimed. And you can, on, the, on the left is a photo from the 1990s showing the full extent of mining and then on the right is what it looks like today. And if you go out there, it's open to the public, uh, you, you probably wouldn't know that there was ever a mine there. Uh, Liberty Gold, we assumed the project ownership um, in 2004, excuse me, 2014. Uh, we've doubled the size of the project through state mining claims. Uh, we've undertaken a huge effort to digitize all the historic data that we could find. Uh, we went through a plan of operations with the BLM and Utah Division of Oil, Gas and Mines. Um, geophysical data, geologic mapping. Uh, we've spent over $20 million on drilling. And uh, last two years ago, we submitted a preliminary economic assessment. And that's kind of what the project is. And I want to get into the cool GIS stuff. Uh, when we first acquired the property, we started gathering data as much as we could. Um, the state's Utah state resources were just invaluable for this. Um, Utah DOGM. Their permit files they had all the uh existing permit files scanned in their database that were free to download uh one of the most useful is here on the right was their reclamation map so i know exactly where they had disturbance and when it was reclaimed it was a good baseline for us um the utah spatial geospatial resource center uh just, you all know about that, about that great data air photos dems roads base maps uh, the State Institutional Trust Lands Administration, uh, land status maps, 
of the Division of Water Rights for our water right data compilation and search, uh, the Utah Geological Survey for geologic maps and other data, uh, Washington County geologic, excuse me, parcels and recorded documents, um, the BLM's navigator for mining claims and uh, other permitting information, uh, plus all of our historical data and all of it went into our GIS system. Of ArcGIS and uh, LeapFrog. And that supports our permitting efforts, our geolo geology and modeling efforts, as well as our engineering. Um, we use ArcGIS as our primary uh, data management. Uh, we, all of our geologic data, geophysics, geochemistry goes into ArcGIS. But it also, we also use a 3D modeling program called leapfrog and it's a design for mineral projects uh, subsurface 3d modeling of all your geology and geochemical data um, for permitting uh, this is the main focus of this talk uh, we are mostly on blm administrated land uh, with some private property in the center that's shown in yellow um, a sitla leads in the southern part shown in blue uh, we had a BLM plan of operations and environmental assessment in 2016. And with that, we have a maximum of 77 acres of disturbance that we can create. And that's within the red area, um, which is the main uh, mineralized trend. We can't go above 77 acres and we can't go outside of that red area. So those are two important uh, uh, caps that we have and we have to keep track of all this. Part of our 3D modeling, we have this new software that lets us view the deposit in three dimensions, and that's something that you know, past generations did not have. What we can do with this then is instead of drilling a, a grid pattern, so every 100 feet you build a road, you build a pad, you drill, another 300 feet you drill a road. That creates a lot of disturbance. Uh, with our new system, we can target the holes uh, from a single drill site. So on, on the left is a cross section showing one pad on the left with, I don't know how many, 10 drill holes targeting our deposit. And then another drill hole, maybe 500 feet away, another pad 500 feet away uh, with several drill holes. Um, and then the plan view on the right, you can see that this creates these kind of radial patterns. All of that just minimizes our surface disturbance so that we don't have to worry about uh, building a whole bunch of roads and uh, a whole bunch of uh, pads that we don't need. Uh, we can get a lot of mileage out of uh, just a few roads and pads. So that's one of the ways we really make this more efficient with our GIS system. Uh, I've been able to get imagery over multiple decades here uh, from various sources. We have uh, 1976 pre-mining, 1993 active mining, that's the USGS DOQs, um, 2011 the post-reclamation, but before Liberty took over the project, which we use as an environmental baseline. Um, in 2018, we got LIDAR data uh, for our active exploration, and then uh, Doug provided us with some digital globe data uh, from 2021 that shows our reclamation. So uh, all this is very useful for tracking our, our reclamation. So how do I do it in GIS? Uh, drill roads are represented by center lines and a drill site is represented by a point. Um, and then I can have lots of different attributes. I need to track the reclamation status, the date it was built, the date it was reclaimed, um, uh, the land status underneath and some other attributes. It's a great way to do this in GIS. For planning purposes, we use ArcGIS to draw some lines and points. But then once they're built, our geologists will use a half meter accuracy GPS along with ArcGIS field maps to capture the road center lines and drill hole locations. And we're using this G uh, Juniper Systems geode that we bought from Juniper Systems in Logan, Utah. It's a great tool. Those rows and points go into a slope model that I created. It's important to know the slope that you're building a road on because a road that's on a steep slope 
creates a bigger footprint disturbance, um, disturbance footprint than one on a gentle slope. And it costs a lot more to reclaim a road on a steep slope. Um, so on the map on the left here, I've got uh, the darker areas represent steep slopes, lighter areas represent gentle slopes. Take this, I convert my classified slope map into a polygon layer, and then I have this um, ArcGIS mark builder model builder that um, will split the road center lines against the slope class polygon. And so then I get a, a a series of segments of lines, and each segment has the slope assigned to it. And, and then for the points, um, it's just a spatial join so that it'll join the slope class to the point. That feeds into my model. And then I can take the output from my model and I summarize all the data in Excel, pivot tables and create. That goes into a spreadsheet, which is called the Nevada Surface Reclamation Cost Estimator Model. This is a spreadsheet model that was developed by the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Reclamation. The BLM, several companies, and uh, some consultants to estimate how much it would cost to reclaim a mine. Um, it's a very complicated model, very complicated spreadsheet. Um, I take the data that I get out of my model builder and put in here. So I can say that for slopes of 20 to 30 percent, I've got 9,000 feet of road and 20 sites, and it will tell me what the footprint of that is. It will tell me a lot more than that. It tells me how much it's going to cost to regrade it, the kinds of equipment I need, how many people it's going to take. It, it's an extremely complex model. Um, it calculates, as I said before, it calculates the foot cut and fill, regrading volumes, reseeding requirements. Um, in Nevada, our projects are required to use this as well as Idaho. For Utah Dogum, all I need is just the footprint, and that goes into a different formula that they use. So you're almost out of time, Gerald. Okay. I'll run fast. Um, in 2018, we got new LiDAR data, which made it really easy to uh, create polygons around our sites. So uh, very accurate polygons that helped me recalibrate my surfacy model when I realized that we were closer to our 77 acre cap than before. Um, the, the elevation data from the LiDAR was great because now I can, with high detail, I can see our safety berms, our sumps, the working surface, and I can even see some historic mining features that were hidden under the vegetation. Um, so a couple of quick photos on the left is an active drill site um, that's been graded. Uh, that sump is there for to let drilling water with non-toxic fluids percolate back into the soil. And then everything gets reclaimed in the middle photo. And then eight months after we reclaimed it, you would never know that there was a drill site there. Uh, we use the data to report to DOGM. Uh, I provide Kim Coburn with the GIS data, and then she can be us out in the field and do field inspections. Uh, with that, we were able to release 24 acres last year uh, from our bond, um, and that let us use that data somewhere else. What's next? I'm thinking about experimenting with different ways to visualize what a, a these drill sites will look like in GIS for planning purposes. Um, I'm talking about a a web application with Kim so that she can see in real time what we're doing, um, converting my model builder to Python. Uh, what makes us different uh, above and beyond, we compiled a lot of data uh, from a lot of different sources using all this JS and 3D modeling in innovative ways for solving these complex problems, like how many acres are we disturbing? How can we minimize our disturbance? Uh, we can plan out our projects, make efficient use of our resources, minimize our disturbance, and avoid these environmental problems. Um, Liberty Gold, we're committed to transparency in our operations and reporting and operating at the highest standards. Um, just last month, uh, Dogum granted Liberty Gold an Environmental Excellence Award uh, for her work in our innovation with this technology and going above and beyond industry standards and the state regulations. 
And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, listening today. Uh, thanks to Kim and Yujik for accommodating me uh, while I had COVID. And uh, thank you very much. So then, thank you so much, Cheryl. So they don't have any questions for him. They they have combed through thousands and thousands of paper data. They have gone through and collected thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of points. They model things in three D. And it's some of the largest databases I've ever seen on this type of data. Any questions on managing or creating a system from scratch? Um, can you go back to that geode tab, the one device that you have? Um, so Tom, oh, that one, yes. So like Tom with Munson Engineering is out there and they have this device available for selling right now it's about twenty five hundred dollars or you can rent it from him for fifty dollars a day or 150 dollars a week um they use it to get sub meter accuracy so that they can be able to figure out where they're at in the field like literally they're digging a they're digging a trench and then they're able to get it that exact same day and connect to it through rts online these areas are so remote they don't have internet they don't have satellite service but we still have accurate up-to-date information on them so I thought that might be helpful because he'll have that little device out there for you guys to see too. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate how great it is that the state of Utah provides all of this data. Um, it's stunning. <laughs>